Our scripture today for this day of the Holy Trinity comes from Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called and the house filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me. I am lost for I am a man of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. This is an odd day with an odd text from Isaiah. On a day where the liturgical calendar invites us to ponder the ways in which God is revealed in Trinity, here we have the story of a prophet. Isaiah was uh, probably someone who was religiously trained working in the temple, but living in a time when his country was thrown into instability from lack of leadership. And then one day he has this vision. Isaiah sees God seated on a throne surrounded by angels who are singing. And while he expresses his own insufficiency to be there, the angels waste no time in fixing that, cleansing him with fiery coal. And our text ends with God calling for someone to speak on God's behalf and Isaiah answering. Now we have this crazy story of a vision from Isaiah, along with countless other stories of people seeing God in scripture, Abraham and the divine visitors who told him he and Sarah would have a baby. That's crazy. Paul, being struck down on the road to Damascus, told he would stop persecuting the church, what he had devoted his life to, and be the biggest evangelist for Jesus Christ. That's crazy. The whole book of Revelation, talk about crazy. John's vision of a world redeemed and renewed in the name of Jesus. We also have stories outside of scripture, right? Visions of God throughout history. Joan of Arc being told she would save France. St. Francis being told to give up his riches to live a life of moral example. And you all know my favorite, Julian of Norwich, who had visions of God's deep and abiding love, wrote them down and became the first published female author in the English language. We perhaps have stories of visions now that seem more mainstream to us, but are no less mysterious and radical. Dr. King's dream comes to mind, especially as a vision not yet fulfilled. I think we have a vision story on Trinity Sunday because both are mysterious. I personally have not had a vision like Isaiah describes or like Paul's or Jones or Julian's. Maybe you have. But even if you have, I suspect it would be pretty hard to explain. And likewise, anytime I begin to try to explain the Trinity, I end up talking in circles at best and at worst, dancing right into unhelpful heresies. Side note, heresies is just a word for beliefs that made white men uncomfortable. So if that's what you want to do, more power to you. But... The movement of God in three persons is just as mysterious and inexplicable and outside of my everyday experience as seraphs surrounding the throne of God, burning my sinful lips. 
And yet there is a thread in all of these stories that feels familiar. In almost every vision, the person having a vision comes up with a whole lot of excuses. Paul said, oh no, I have made my name persecuting you. You can't use me. Joan of Arc was a young peasant girl who couldn't possibly lead a military against Britain. Moses, when he saw the burning bush telling him to lead his people out of Egypt, said, oh no, I have a stutter. I can't do that. And here's Isaiah in the throne room of God saying, ooh, I shouldn't be here. I'm really sinful. Everyone I know is sinful. The place I come from is sinful. You can't possibly use me. And every single time these visionaries give God their excuse, God doesn't listen. God either fixes whatever insecurity they're babbling on about or simply uses them despite their excuses. Here in Isaiah, he's complaining about his sinful lips, right? Not because our lips cause us to sin, but rather they reveal our sinful hearts. And God's angels just like come and cleanse him. And once the excuse is out of the way, the call comes and Isaiah has no other choice. He is out of excuses. Whom shall I send to my people? Here I am. Send me. The best visionaries don't keep their experience to their cell. Once they, the obstacles or the excuses are taken away, then they go and do what they are called to do and they tell people. That's why these names and visions are known to us today. They might know that what they saw was mysterious or even crazy, but that doesn't stop them from trusting that the call was real. They are propelled into the world, even a world that they know will reject them because they are too radical. They go because their experience of God helps them to know that this much is true for God so loved the world that God gave the only son. True visionaries experience that love and share it, trusting that God will bring the call to fruition. Now you are probably sitting there thinking, well, pastor, that's all well and good, but I haven't had a vision like that. I've not had God revealed to me. To which I say, yeah, sure, maybe you haven't seen shining lights or angels with six wings. But God has been revealed to you. When you were baptized, as those waters poured over you, God showed up. In the bread and wine of communion each and every week, even as we do it in this imperfect medium on Zoom, even if you are just on your couch in your living room by yourself, God shows up. God, the mysterious parent, rebel, and Holy Spirit speaks to you in many and various ways. This past year, we marked, or this past week, we marked the anniversary of George, George Floyd's death. And we know that in this past year, God has shown up in the uprising of the BLM movement and all of the ways in which our siblings of color have cried out and called for us to join in the vision for change and justice. And just like the angels use the fiery coal to get rid of Isaiah's excuses, so the sacraments wipe away any excuses we might have. You think you're not good enough? Not articulate enough? Not religious enough? You think you're too white, too entrenched in the system, too set in your ways to change? Too bad. God claimed you in those waters and nourished you at this table and calls you just like God called Isaiah and Paul and Moses and Julian and Dr. King and countless others throughout time. God calls you now through your neighbors, those you know and those you don't. And the call is at once very hard 
and very simple. It's hard because no one likes a prophet or a visionary. The world tends to reject those who call it to be different. We've seen this so often in this past year, people writing off protests as riots, as if riots aren't powerful in and of themselves. The call is complicated because the world demands some sort of purity test that we as sinful people with sinful lips can never achieve on our own. But the call is simple because God is the one calling. And it's God's message of love and justice and peace. You might not think you're the one to tell the world about God's mysterious love. But God thinks you are. How will you answer? When we break into small groups, if you choose to join one, I'd like you to share about what your go-to excuses are. What do you say when God comes knocking? And what do you think God is calling you to do right now? My prayer is that you trust even when you can't understand, even when you don't think you're good enough, and that you trust enough to say, here I am, send me, amen.